Dr. Hussey, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, it's good to finally connect. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, my pleasure. I, I'm really excited about this. I think, you know, your your story, your journey, the information you share, it's pretty um, revolutionary in many ways. Like, I don't think many people are yet aware of some of these principles. So I'm really looking forward to kind of just digging into it and letting you do your thing. For sure. Um, so I'm totally open to kind of starting wherever you think best but I guess you know going back into a little bit of your health history um and yeah sort of the the timeline which takes us to today mm -hmm. yeah yeah so just kind of a span of my my uh why I'm into this kind of stuff I guess um so you know at a very young age I had a lot of chronic inflammatory conditions is what I guess you would categorize them as um, everything from, well, I mean, I first started out with asthma, at like two years old. Um, and then, um, and my father recognized that as asthma very quickly because he had struggled with asthma. Okay. Um, and so they were, you know, I was with the inhalers and the nebulizer and all that kind of stuff when I was a kid, I remember. Um, but yeah, I had like chronic hives all over my body at some point, um, where they just break out like hives, like huge hives on my body. Um, I had irritable bowel syndrome. I had terrible allergies just lots of inflammatory type things. And then ultimately ended up with autoimmune, quote unquote, autoimmune type one diabetes. That's the theory anyways, um, where my body no longer makes insulin. Um, so I have to give myself insulin, which is different than type two diabetes in which you still make insulin, but your body's not responding to it because there's something pathological going on. Um, so different things. Um, so yeah, that kind of, you know, threw my parents and I into this world of Western medicine and like, relying on Western medicine to help us, you know, manage these conditions. But that's the key word is that manage them, not explain why they were there or what was happening, just ma uh, manage the symptoms. Or, you know, I remember as a type one diabetic, you know, you had to count carbohydrates and give insulin for the carbohydrates, which I was never told to account for protein, which is something you needed to do. But because if you're eating carbohydrates, the proteins aren't as relevant. And I was always eating carbohydrates. As I was never told it's way easier to manage things without eating carbohydrates especially processed food carbohydrates. Um, but yeah, and I was kind of thrown into that world. And then it wasn't until college that I started to figure out that you could eat different things or live my life a different way. And these conditions became way easier to manage. And lots of them disappeared. All of them disappeared, actually, except for type 1 diabetes. That's just kind of collateral damage from that inflammation that's still there. Um, and so it was just interesting to me in my head, like I'd never been told that by these people that are supposed to know the body inside and out and how it works um, and have all the answers. And so that kind of started my disillusionment with with Western medicine. And, uh, you know, in college, I also, um, you know, transferred from my pediatric endocrinologist to a, an actual endocrinologist or, or like an adult endocrinologist, not an actual one. But, um, but uh, and then he was very like pushy about medications. He was like, um, you know, here's this blood pressure medication to protect your kidneys. Here's this cholesterol medication, not because you have high cholesterol, just because that's the standard of care for anybody who's just type one diabetic for 15 years, like you've been. And I was just like, well, I don't have high cholesterol, which we now know is not even an issue now, but, um, and like, I didn't have high blood pressure. Matter of fact, I had borderline low blood pressure. Like it was 112 over, um, uh, 82 or 72. And so it's just like, you want to give me a blood pressure medication? Like low blood pressure is more acutely dangerous than high blood pressure. Like, uh, so anyways, I just started to slowly get this disillusionment with, with Western medicine and that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Cause I knew for a long time that I wanted to be some sort of physician. And so my parents had always taken me to chiropractors, uh, as a kid. And so I was like, well, yeah, I'll go to be a chiropractor. And, um, so I went to do that and then got a master's degree in human nutrition and functional medicine. But this whole time, learning all these things in a formal setting, um, I always, you know, kind of focused in on the heart because I've been told as a type one diabetic, you're heavily predisposed to heart disease and vascular issues. And so I'd always kind of wanted to learn more about that. Although, you know, looking back, what I learned formal in a formal education wasn't anything like what uh, reality is. It's just like the baseline education of how we understand, you know, how the system works or whatever. And so I've always just been curious um, and had this, this doubt in Western medicine. And so that kind of spurned me to keep looking and keep looking and doing my own independent research. And eventually I 
had all this information about the heart that was very contrary to what we're told as far as why it's there, what it does, what causes heart disease. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about those things. And, um, and so, yeah, I just kind of kept going in that direction and eventually started sharing it on social media and people started to like it. And, um, and, uh, then eventually wrote a book about it. And then despite my best efforts, um, I actually had a cardiac event, um, and about three and a half years ago now. And, you know, the reason for that, you know, my best guess, cause no one can really tell me why it happened. There was no atherosclerosis in my arteries. Um, a spontaneous clot formed in the left anterior descending artery. Um, and it totally blocked the artery. And, you know, that has, that has plunged me even further into the investigation of, of what heart disease is and why this happens. And, you know, from what I found, you know, atherosclerosis or gradual narrowing of an artery is a very different thing than spontaneous clotting, or it happens for very different reasons. Um, and so in my case, there was no atherosclerosis, a clot formed. And it was accumulation of, uh, or a culmination of things like I'd been going through like a very stressful time. And then I had very stressful news a day and a half before I had the heart attack. Um, and I was looking back, I was definitely, uh, dehydrated probably pretty chronically at that point because of the diet that I was eating um, and the way I wasn't replacing fluids. I was not doing things that I know are critically important now for the flow of blood and prevention of clotting, which are like um, infrared light exposure and grounding. I wasn't doing that as much. Um, and then that stress on top of it. And then also like type one diabetics are, have a, have trouble with their stress response when it comes to exercise. And there's some literature on this. And in that state of stress, I tried to do a very intense exercise or uh, workout, um, just like my normal thing. And I should not have done that. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back and clotting just happened. So um, just kind of this, this, you know, alignment of the planets thing kind of happened. And here I am, but I have learned, you know, it was a terrible thing that happened, but I learned so much from that. It put me directly into the shoes of someone dealing with that in a hospital setting. So I got to experience that firsthand. Um, and come away with it. And I've done pretty much nothing that was recommended to me by Western medicine. And my heart has totally recovered, um, yeah, more so than they were expecting. Um, and they're kind of befuddled about that. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just pushed me further and further and I've discovered more and more things. And, you know, within the last three years, definitely gotten into more, uh, quantum aspects of things and biophysics, um, which I was aware of before, but never really to the level that I know now. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's just me. And now I'm just trying to share the information because I know that there's going to be people out there or there are people out there that are going to unfortunately be in that situation that I was or in the situation uh, of heart disease now. And how are you supposed to make educated decisions about your health if you don't have all the information mm -hmm. and the mainstream information we get about heart disease is not all the information by a long shot. Yeah. And I guess, you know, there's so much stuff that we can, we can start to think about there. Um, I'm just thinking in regards to your book and some of the big kind of topics and findings that you had in your research, but you've already touched on the idea of cholesterol, total cholesterol, not being sort of a, a big risk factor, like most of us have been told. Um, are you happy just to, just to expand on that a little bit? Cause that will be new for some of our listeners. You know, I think there's still certainly in the public, uh, this idea that your cholesterol is a, a big risk factor. So what were some of your findings there? Yeah. So, um, well, it's, first of all, like in the hospital, when I was recovering after the heart attack, I kept asking why this happened. And all the doctors said, well, your cholesterol, oh, your cholesterol. That's, that was the answer that I, it was just like the, the, you know, the, um, jerk react knee reaction, you know, just all oh, your cholesterol. And I was just like, my cholesterol is fine. Like, so according to your standards, you know, it's fine. Uh, so what happened? And they're like, oh, it's cholesterol. Like, okay. Um, so just, you know, it's very clear they're taught that, and that's just kind of what's programmed into their head. So to completely understand this, I guess you have to go through the history of it. Um, and so like, you know, in the early 1900s, um, heart disease was not a thing. It wasn't a very big deal. Very few people had heart disease and there wasn't even a field of cardiology really. There was a few doctors and researchers that were interested in the heart and they were researching it, but it wasn't really what it is today. Um, and then after World War II, heart disease started to rise pretty significantly uh, for whatever reason. 
And, you know, President Eisenhower had a heart attack in the Oval Office pretty famously, and everybody was worried about this disease that was spreading. So first of all, how could a disease, um, a new disease like this, be caused by something like red meat, saturated fat, cholesterol, something that humans have been eating since the humans have been here? I mean, there's even evidence that it's, it's, it's a large part of what made us who we are today evolutionarily. Um, eating red meat and animals. So how could something like that be the cause of a very new disease? That doesn't make sense, um, logically. So, you know, the world was looking for an answer and this guy named Ansel Keys, this is a researcher at uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota, um, he gave everybody an answer. He did these, these studies where he looked at the amounts of saturated fat and cholesterol that people ate uh, according to country and the amounts of heart disease that they had. And he found this correlation uh, between the amount of saturated fat and cholesterol people ate and the rates of heart disease. Um, first of all, that's epidemiology research. So it's the lowest form of research there is because it's not able to show you if something causes something, only if they're happening at the same time. So like the example I give is if you're standing on the sidewalk and you see a traffic jam and you also see that it's cloudy, you can't say the traffic jam caused the clouds or clouds caused the traffic jam. You can just see that they're happening at the same time. Right. Further, further damning of his of his conclusion was that he there was data from 22 countries available at the time, and he picked the seven that gave him the correlation that he wanted. So he cherry picked the data. And later, uh, two scientists repeated the study with all from data from all 22 countries, and they found no correlation. Um, so for some reason, he, he was wanting to give this answer that it was cholesterol and saturated fat. And there's, you know, theories that he was backed uh, or he was uh, influenced by money from industry, like the cereal and grain industry and the sugar industry and pharmaceutical industry, which had a drug that could lower cholesterol. Like they wanted to push this theory. And it's, a, it's one of the most heavily tested nutritional theories out there because it's very expensive to do nutritional research. Um, but there was five or six um, big studies done after this theory came out, testing the replacement of unsaturated fat with or the replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated fat in the diet, um, which more cholesterol, right? And they actually found the exact opposite of what they thought they were going to find. Uh, they find they they found that the more unsaturated fat that people ate, the more uh, heart disease they had, the more all cause mortality they had in general. Um, so saturated fat clearly better. However, that evidence was kind of swept under the rug. The theory had already taken off. There was already a lot of money behind it, um, and so that's just became the conventional wisdom. And so then in 1984, um, this committee was put together um, to decide, kind of finally decide if cholesterol was good or bad for us. Um, and you know, the pharmaceutical companies got wind of this and they came in and they funded this committee and they, not surprisingly, decided that cholesterol was bad. Um, and so once that happened, um, they put together these these um, education committees to go educate physicians about how cholesterol was bad and how to lower it to treat heart disease um, with no real evidence behind it just to do it. And the pharmaceutical companies, companies sponsored the lowering of what cholesterol should be. Um, at first, they decided that your LDL, uh, and these are, these are American numbers, LDL should be uh, 250 or lower. And then over the years, it went to 200 and then to 150 and then 100. And now they say lower than 100 is best because the more that you could lower the recommendation of what it could be, the more people could get prescribed medications. And statin drugs are one of the highest prescribed medications out there today. Um, and there's also other cholesterol lowering drugs out there. But the whole theory, um, there was no evidence behind it whatsoever. And if you look at um, cholesterol and what it does, it's vitally important for the body. There's lots of evidence that having low cholesterol, like 100 or lower, which is what they're saying you need, um, causes um, a higher risk of infection, higher risk of heart disease, higher risk of cancer, lower cognitive abilities, um, and uh, and lower and higher risk of all-cause mortality from anything. Um, and so this is a vitally important molecule. And there's also evidence that you know in like these studies where they they study people with genetically high cholesterol. And they found that they don't live any shorter of a life than people with quote unquote normal cholesterol. Um, and the reason if they do live a shorter life, they they concluded that it wasn't because of the cholesterol, it's because of the other things they were doing. They were these people were smoking more and drinking more and not moving and eating a processed food diet and things like that. So yeah, there's really no evidence behind this theory. It's just totally ingrained. 
in Western medicine. And quite frankly, not only is it ingrained in in people who think cholesterol and your lipid panel is what tells you if you'll get heart disease or not, it's not only ingrained in those people, it's ingrained in the people that don't buy into that theory. And they're obsessed with, with um, still analyzing lipids, thinking that it's going to tell us what the risk of heart disease is or if there's risk or not. And in my opinion, it's not. Like It's this thing that can only tell you about what you're metabolizing. If you look at a, a cholesterol panel um, that you get from your doctor, um, it can tell you basically what your body is choosing to metabolize at that moment based on you know the macronutrients that you're eating. So basically how many how much sugar you're eating versus how much fat are you eating. Um, and if you're like if you're restricting glucose, your your LDL is likely to go up um, because your body's trying to take those that cholesterol and that uh, fat in those lipoproteins and deliver it to the tissues because your body's using fat for fuel. If you're eating more carbohydrates, it's likely to go down and triglycerides might go up because your body is taking that glucose and converting it to triglycerides. So you can see the numbers shift on that panel based on your metabolism. And, you know, it can give you an idea if there's insulin resistance, um, like, you know, you're on the way to type 2 diabetes, if you look at certain numbers. And it can give you an indication if there's inflammation, if you take things like oxidized LDL or things like that. Um, but generally, it's telling you about your metabolism. It's not telling you about risk of heart disease. Um, and the reason being is that when you look at atherosclerosis, which is the plaque in the arteries, if you look at that, like there's plenty of studies that have been where they analyze what the plaque is, and it's not cholesterol. It's uh, it's clotting material, like fibrotic clotting, the same thing that would form if you cut your skin and a scab formed. It's clotting material. So it's happening when there's damage to the artery. It's not because cholesterol just says, oh, you know what? I'm, there's a lot of me here. I'm just going to go embed myself into the lining of the artery today. Um, that just doesn't happen. And so what we really should be looking for is risk of clotting. Um, that's what causes atherosclerosis, like chronically slowly over time. And it's also what causes stroke, heart attack. That is, we know. We know that clots form. Uh, that's what it is. Um, and so that's what we should be looking at. So this whole cholesterol theory has just been this huge distraction from the actual things that cause heart disease and, you know, happy to go into the things that, that cause clotting, uh, if you want, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the, the history. It's really interesting to, to understand it. And I think, you know, the more I read and sort of observe, the more I feel that there are other examples to some degree that kind of align with what's happened with cholesterol. Um, but as you kind of say there, I guess the next obvious question is, you know, what are the risk factors then from a clotting perspective? Yeah. So to understand this, we need to understand the things that cause clotting. So back in 1856, long time ago, this guy named Rudolf Virchow said, um, these are the things that happen there that um, encourage or increase risk of clotting in the vascular system. And they are. Damage to the lining of the artery, um, just like you damage your skin and the clot forms, right, um, to stop the bleeding. Um, poor blood flow or interruptions in blood flow or stagnant blood um, or when the elements of blood clump together, um, they start to stick together too much. And it makes sense. You know, if if we get damaged to something and everybody's trying to repair it with a clot um, or if we get things that are clumped together and not moving well through the system, they're more likely to clot, you know, just coagulating and clot. Um, so that stuff makes sense. And those things, you know, back in 1856, he said those things, and they're still hold true in medicine today. They're generally accepted in medicine today. These are the things that cause clotting. Okay. Um, and there's all like clotting is, is an, an important part of physiology. It's supposed to happen sometimes, right? Like, again, if you damage your skin, you want clotting the form where you're just going to keep bleeding forever. Um, and, and so the reason that is, is that, you know, like, if you look at like, even just stress, stress increases clotting factors in the blood tremendously. Um, and the reason for that is, is that evolutionarily, if we were under that amount of acute stress, usually it's because we're fighting for our lives, or we're running away from something that wants to eat us or kill us. And there's a likelihood that we get injured. And so when we're stressed like that, clotting factors go up preparing for that injury in case it happens um, so that you clot faster and you know there's less likely that you'll lose too much blood and stay alive. So it makes sense evolutionarily. Um, but if we want to stop clotting in the vascular system, we have to understand the physics of the vascular system, which up until now, um, well, 
you know, not just up until now. It's not like I made some revolutionary discovery or anything. I'm just looking at science that people have done over the years. Um, but like most of most of the conversation about heart disease has been this biochemistry. You know, you're you're looking at your blood work panel and your lip lipoproteins in the blood. Um, and there's been really no talk uh, in the mainstream about the biophysics of how blood actually moves um, and and water in the vascular system. And so if we learn about water a little bit, we start to see how important it is in the vascular system. And so water, like the blood is about half water. And water has unique abilities in that it can hold energy, um, radiant energy, like in the form of infrared light or electromagnetic fields and things like that. Um, and when it holds energy and it gets next to a, a you know, it's a water loving surface. Um, it gets next to that biological surface. Um, and when it gets next to that, it actually kind of rearranges its molecules and splits them in a certain way that it creates this gel, uh, this layer of structured water, so they call it, or exclusion zone water or fourth phase water, so they call it. And so it's not quite ice and it's not quite water. Um, it's kind of this gel, kind of like the consistency of an egg white um, or um, jello, you know, like kind of, it kind of gives a little bit and it bounces back, right? Um, and this gel, it does lots of different things for our vascular system. One is that it's called exclusion zone water because it excludes things that aren't it. So it basically performs this barrier between the two things that it's, or between the things that it's structured on and the things in the middle of the artery. Um, and so when things can't um, get through there, it protects the lining of the artery. So there's Virchow's triad number one, is that we want to stop uh, damage to the lining of the artery, we protect it with structured water. Um, so if we build structured water. Um, secondly, They've shown um, in research throughout the years, but especially at the lab of Dr. Gerald Pollack in Wa University of Washington, that when structured water forms, it's a very electronegatively charged because of the way the molecules form. Um, and then next to it, um, a, 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 like a row or a line of very positively charged hydrogens line up next to it. So we have a, a negative space next to a positive space, and that is a battery. Um, if you take a look at a battery, you're always figuring out which end to put with it. It's a positive and negative end. So with structured water, it creates energy that's created through the battery actually does the work of moving fluid. Um, and they've actually shown this in Dr. Pollock's lab that you take like a, 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 a tube made of a water loving material and you put it in water, a tub of water, and you put infrared light on it and the fluid starts to move um, with no, you know, outside force uh, working on it to move it. It just starts to move. And so this is how blood moves, right? So there's Virchow's triad number two, which is keep blood moving, no stagnant blood, Right. So the heart is actually not the main mover of blood. It's it's these mechanisms. Uh, the heart does a little bit of moving, but no more than enough to get the blood through the chambers of the heart itself. These mechanisms are what actually create blood flow uh, and lymphatic flow and cerebral spinal fluid flow. All the fluid in the body is, moves this way. So the third thing is that the elements of blood, so we're talking about red blood cells, lipoproteins, every, various other proteins, whatever else may happen to be in there, uh, different metabolites. Um, they actually are also biological surfaces, obviously. And so they get structured water forming on them. And so structured water forms on them. And since structured water is elect negatively charged, then those elements have um, a, a negative charge surrounding them called zeta potential. That's what it's been termed by researchers. Um, and the zeta potential is negatively charged and the blood is positively charged because of the hydrogens and element of blood that's negatively charged. They don't like each other, and so because like charges repel, and so they don't stick together. They stay away from each other, um, and so that keeps elements of blood evenly spaced and not clumping together. And that's all you know is in our system. Um, and so we want to do things. So that's Virchow's triad number three: keep keep the blood evenly spaced, not coagulating. Right. So structured water in our bodies takes care of all these things that predispose us to clotting. Um, and so we will. So everyone's probably asking, 
how do you build structured water in the body? Like, how do you do that? Like, and so, like I said, water has the ability to hold energy. And um, when you hold, when water holds energy, it structures itself. So the, the most in Dr. Pollock's lab, they found that the, the, um, the type of energy that uh, structures water the best is the 3000 nanometer wavelength of infrared light, um, which comes from the sun. It's the farthest of infrared light that comes from the sun. And about 42% of the, of the sun's rays are infrared. Um, so that's the main energy source of infrared. That's why it makes sense evolutionarily. Um, but in our modern day, we can use things like infrared sauna. Um, but, you know, water doesn't just absorb infrared. That's just the most absorbed by water, but it'll, it'll help with red light um, or all different wavelengths of light will be absorbed by water and help it structure itself. It's just infrared is the best. Um, but also things like grounding, um, putting your feet directly on the earth, um, that will energize your body. You'll soak up electrons directly from the earth. And they've actually shown studies that um, grounding increases blood flow. And it also increases uh, the zeta potential on red blood cells um, to keep things evenly spaced and moving. Um, and so we're designed uh, to get energy from our environment in various ways. And this energy is supposed to help us maintain a negative charge. And that negative charge is held in structured water. Um, because structural water doesn't just happen in the arteries. It happens in all the cells. It's why my tissue feels like a gel. If I pick it around, it moves a little bit, but it, it bounces back. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how you prevent clotting. Um, so everybody wants to say, well, how do I, how do I test for risk of that? You know, risk of clotting and, um, and there's various things you could take, you know, um, but those things change very rapidly, you know, like you could take it at one instance in time. That's great. But a blood test is just one instance in time. Uh, it's not gonna like it's not gonna tell you about how you are you know chronically over the day or over the week or whatever. And so, um, but things you could look at for clotting are like I mean you could look at inflammation like high sensitivity to C reactive protein um, and various other you know different um, uh, you know markers of damage oxidative damage things like that. Um, but you look at risk of clotting too. I mean you could look at like thrombin time and prothrombin time and um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is just a measure of like how readily your your blood cells, red blood cells clump together. So obviously if they don't do so readily, there's more structured water on them. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, then there's lots of different things you could look, you look at nitric oxide as far as blood flow, you could look at, um, you know, I don't know, just various things that give you risk of clotting. But again, those things change very rapidly. Just because you take it at one instance of time doesn't mean that it's not going to change dramatically if you go through a stress or something like that. So, you know, these, this testing is somewhat of a hyper reality. So I tell people like, if I want to measure my risk of clotting, I'm measuring, okay, how often am I getting infrared light exposure? How often am I putting my feet directly on the earth? How stressed am I? Um, you know, how many acute stresses versus chronic stresses do I have? And what types of stresses are they? Like those types of things, you know, um, like measuring those types of things or, or just kind of being cognizant of how often you do those things is a much better indicator of how at risk you're going to be than any certain level on a test. Okay. That's so interesting that those sorts of things would be the true risk factors, as it were. Um, I think it, as you say, it makes sense evolutionary, but it is, it's a paradigm shift ultimately when you compare it to the conventional wisdom at the moment. Um, so just you said one thing that, that I just wanted to clarify, which was around the lymphatic system. And mm. I think you said that these mechanisms around sort of structured water and light also help move lymph. Was that right? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I mean, the lymphatic system doesn't have any sort of contracting organ right. associated with it. It just, it, it moves. And we're we're made to believe that it moves because of contraction of muscle and, and gravity and things like that. But that doesn't... That doesn't hold water, no pun intended. Um, but uh, but yeah, it moves by these other mechanisms. This and you know there are things that can interfere with lymphatic fluid uh, or motion, um, like just bound up tissue, um, scar tissue, things like that, or imbalances in muscles that cut off lymphatic channels and things like that. But ultimately, it moves when the pathways are clear through these mechanisms of structured water, which. That's incredibly important because the lymphatic system is our drainage system. Like we need to be, you know, every single night, if we're getting enough melatonin production from the right light signaling, we need to be um, detoxing and getting waste removal from the lymphatic system to um, to the liver to get detoxified and get out of us. Because if we get don't, we get like a traffic jam of toxic buildup, um, and that's going to leave us more prone to 
definitely seasonal illness, um, and uh, but also lots of different uh, issues as far as inflammation and oxidative stress from this backup of toxins. Yeah. And I guess with all of that information, is there any data or is it just safe to assume that, you know, with cardiovascular disease and things like this, there's there's significant seasonal variation as well then? Oh, yeah, there's definitely data that heart disease is worse in the winter. Um, and so uh, what do we do in the winter? We get away from the earth. You know, we go inside. We're under artificial light more. Uh, the sun goes down sooner, so we have less um, uh, natural light and more artificial light. Um, and so a lot of that has to do of our rem from our removal from those things. Uh, we're definitely less likely to go put our feet in the earth if it's freezing outside. Um, but also there's other issues with seasonal, us not paying attention to the seasons. Um, one is um, you know, just eating foods out of season can be very confusing to our bodies. Um, and without the amount of light that uh, we get in the summer or in the warmer months, um, then we don't detoxify as well. We don't get rid of toxins as well. We don't get rid of what's called deuterium as well. Um, and so, you know, foods higher in deuterium are the more carbohydrate heavy foods, whether it's fruit or processed uh, grains and sugars and things. And sunlight helps us get rid of the, that. So naturally when carbohydrates are more available in the summer, we also have those when we have sunlight that helps us get rid of them. We, if we eat those foods out of season in the winter and we're not getting the sunlight, then that causes a lot of metabolic issues. They would be available in the winter months. They shouldn't be as available. Um, and they are to us today um, because of we can ship food around, around the world and stuff. But the other issue with the, seasonal, um, the seasonality of heart disease, and it's not just heart disease. Cancer is worse in the winter chronic pains worse in the winter, um, all this stuff. And it's, it's because the light changes and we don't change with the light. We still live the same hours of the day. We just use artificial light. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's a huge issue. It's an issue in the summer as well, but it's a huge issue in the winter because we're supposed to be attuned to the day night cycle. Uh, uh, the sun and, and fire, but fire is not strong enough of a light signal to to trigger like what the sun does. The sun is way brighter. Um, and so, you know, when the sun rises, we're, that's when blue light spikes from the sun. And that tells your body it's daytime. And then um, blue light is slowly rises throughout the day and it's highest at solar noon. And then it gets lower and lower and it goes away after sunset, obviously. And Your body's, when there's lack of blue light, your body's supposed to start making melatonin. And when you make melatonin, that tells your body to go to sleep or pairs your body to go to sleep. And it's also what triggers while you sleep for the um, the detoxification and drainage of the lymph and glymphatic system and mitophagy and autophagy, killing off old cells and mitochondria to make new healthy ones. Just kind of this repair and cleansing process is supposed to happen every single night. And that process is totally shut down we have artificial light telling us that it's noon um, after sunset. Uh, what so happens in the winter, the sun goes down a lot sooner. We turn on artificial light telling your body that it's noon. And so not only do we get sleep issues, um, but we also get this chronic every night not detoxifying uh, and not having that cleansing, deep restorative sleep. And over time, this leads to major issues. And so in the, in the winter, that happens way more, which is why we see these diseases get way worse in the winter. Um, I mean, it's literally like there's more cancer diagnoses, there's more heart attacks, um, chronic pain, um, there's more incidence of chronic pain and chronic people's chronic pain gets worse. Um, it's, it's well documented, uh, that that happens. And it, and this is largely why it's because of artificial light. And if you think about it, like, you know, fire has been around for a long time, obviously. Um, and incandescent bulbs have been around since the late 1800s. Uh, but the ones that are really causing the issue, um, are the the new uh, LEDs and fluorescent bulbs that are only blue light pretty much or primar primarily blue light. And blue light is what tells your body what time it is. Um, and so those are really recommended. And those have been only been around since maybe the 70s, you know? Um, so it's been a really abrupt change for our physiology, a very new thing um, that that's driving this. And that's just, and you know, this is, there's evidence. Like if you just go into PubMed and type in like, 
circadian disruption or blue light and whatever disease you want. Like there's evidence that it's causing it. And I guess with like heart disease, with breast cancer, with um, leptin resistance, which is leading to obesity, uh, with metabolic dysregulation that's leading to, to diabetes, like um, there's tons of it. Uh, and that's is evidenced by how, why things or how things get worse in, in the winter. Yeah. I remember a paper that was talking about metabolic syndrome and was kind of arguing we should rephrase it circadian syndrome. Yeah. Because of that kind of the the level of evidence we have around that. And I guess as you talk about sort of um seasonal variations, you what got think what was going on in my mind was also I kind of view that as the horizontal axis, but on the vertical, we've kind of got the the latitude and the research kind of showing us that latitude will influence risk factors for certain conditions which is just i guess another level of evidence of the importance of light yeah well you know there's a reason that um you know uh that you know when we look at like evolutionarily and arche archaeologically we look at where humans evolved and where we stay was right around the equator you know um and then you know we got really big brains and you know we we found, figured out ways that we could live in colder climates um but you know, the sunlight from the sunlight you get on the equator was what was driving life, you know, uh, and that's why life is more diverse and, um, and uh, abundant, I guess, uh, around the equator. So we have these jungles with these vast amount of species and things because the light is driving everything. And literally all the energy from, for everything on the earth, uh, comes from light. Uh, so from, from the sun. So, um, it's pretty fascinating to think about. And, even like, you know, the way that we harvest energy, like from, you know, our mitochondria and electron transport chain, like in passing electrons, um, these are, these electrons are, are photonic energy, like they're, they're light energy and life has just found a way to harvest that energy using these mechanisms of metabolism that we know of, um, and, uh, and, and use that energy to, create life or sustain life. Um, that's what it is. So if you, if your body starts to get divorced from those things, those ways that it gathers energy, then we start to see disease because body can't use energy. It doesn't have the energy to maintain the order that is life. And so we start to see breaking down and the gut and the vascular system are probably the first two that take the hit because they're the ones that are exposed to all the things from outside that we put in. So it goes straight from the gut into the vascular system, and that's where the body is transporting and moving things. And so those those areas get damaged, um, which is why we see you know high lots of gut issues and lots of um, vascular issues um, first, you know, and then long term we see more metabolic issues uh, and then more cancer things like that down the road. Okay, interesting. It is fascinating, like when you really think about as you kind of say there the sort of the light harvesting and the mechanisms that have been evolved over millennia to to capitalize on it um mm -hmm. we're kind of just i think i'll be right in saying it, reversing photosynthesis ultimately i think is what i've kind of heard before mm -hmm. um, we're liberating light in our cells to to get our energy um and i guess you know i i'm thinking of a few people that are very much in that world who who i often see comment on sort of the more we can reconnect with sort of a healthy light environment, it starts to reduce the, for want of a better way of putting it, reduce the importance from a dietary perspective. It almost gives us that buffer. Um, would you kind of agree with that concept? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, there's a lot of emphasis put, like in the health space, there's a lot of emphasis put on um, like your macronutrients, like how many, you know, fats, glucose, protein you need. Um, and, you know, you get a lot of your energy. I think that it's unclear about how much, but it's it's a lot of energy from, or you're supposed to get a lot of energy from other sources. You can harvest, like your body has mechanisms to harvest energy directly from light um, and directly from the earth, soaking it up from the earth. Um, your mitochondria, if they're functioning properly, um, they are using those electrons to create the things that your body needs. That's, you know, uh, heat um, and uh, water. It's creating water because the water is what holds this charge. Um, it's creating ATP, which is helping cellular function, um, that kind of stuff. And so there's lots of different ways that we harvest this energy, which makes diet, as far from a, from a calorie perspective, less important. 
-hmm. Okay. So what diet, like when I, when people come to me and they're just like, how many fat should I eat? How many carbs should I eat? All this kind of stuff. I say, don't worry about that. You know, um, when you eat food, you want to make sure that it gives you proper nutrients. That's the point of food. And so nutrients are proteins, vitamins, and minerals. That's what you need to focus on. And when you get protein, if you get the most bioavailable protein for humans, which is animal foods, then you're going to get some energy with it. The energy that you do need from food uh, will come with it uh, in the form of fat. And then in season, you know, you could um, eat local in season fruit if you wanted to, if that, you know, grows where you are um, uh, or, you know, those are the, that's pretty much the only natural carbohydrate there would have been evolutionarily until we invented agriculture. Um, but yeah, that makes more sense to focus on just proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Make sure you get enough of those things. Um, and, and then that's what diet should be about. And then reconnect with the things that get you energy elsewhere. And then the other aspect of diet, um, you were saying, like you, you put it well when you said, you know, that this metabolic disorders are like circadian disorders, really. And they've even shown um, pretty conclusively that even when you eat is more important than necessarily what you eat um, from a metabolic perspective, right? So they've shown that they didn't even change what people ate. They were still eating kind of crap diets, um, but they just changed when they ate. And instead of people eating all day long or three meals a day, they just restricted it to an eight to 10 hour, eight to 12 hour window. And usually earlier in the day, which is when light is out and not eating after light goes away, um, started to change people's metabolic health. Uh, they started to lose weight. They started to, their cardiometabolic risk factors, quote unquote, uh, went down um, and uh, and everything starts to normalize. Now, what you eat is very important too. So I, I would also want to change what you ate and make sure you're getting enough proteins, vitamins, and minerals, but it just shows the timing of things is good too. We're supposed to eat when the light is out, when cortisol is, is being triggered. Um, and so well, if, we're, if we're paying attention to light and we're blocking blue light after sunset by using blue blocking glasses and or lower lighting um, and things like that, then we really shouldn't be eating close to bedtime when when the sun has gone down. Um, so it's it is a circadian way of eating too, not just um, you know signaling your body what time it is, but also the activities you do during the day. Okay. A question that comes up, we have a lot of practitioners tuning in and you know in in particular the sort of the nutritional therapy, functional medicine space, obviously the gut microbiome is still a really big topic. So I'm wondering what your what your thoughts are, what your perspective is in regard to everything you've shared today and your concepts, like where does the microbiome fit in with this from like a, a dietary perspective with fiber? We always talk about diversity being really important, but then in certain places of the world, diversity is just not there in the winter in particular, for example. So mm -hmm. kind of just expand on your thoughts there. Yeah. So um, there's some fascinating work by Tim Spector, I think his name is, in, in the UK. And he, you know, he went um, and ate a diet in the UK and he had a certain microbiome or certain diversity or whatever. And then he went to somewhere in Africa and ate the diet that the locals ate there. And his microbiome completely changed in like three days or something like that, completely. And then he went back to the UK and restored. And so part of that could be the diet that he was eating. Part of that could be that the microbe environment he was in and just contacting things around him. Um, but it just, it changes. And so I, you know, I know that there are companies out there that make better probiotics than others. Um, in my opinion, like the spirochete ones are, are a little better because they can survive the stomach acid, but I'm not really convinced that microbiome or that probiotics are the best there, the best way to change your gut microbiome, right? Obviously we want diversity. Um, I think that your gut microbiome is responding to light, definitely. Um, and light signals throughout the day, you know, the red and infrared, then UVA, then UVB actually triggers changes in your microbiome, um, increasing diversity and decreasing diversity as you go through the day. Um, but also through the seasons, um, it changes, uh, probably in accordance to what you should be eating seasonally. Um, but also, uh, what you eat is probably the main driver of what your microbiome is going to be. If you want to change your microbiome, you change what you eat. Um, because the probiotics probably aren't changing it too much. And like probiotic foods, um, like fermented foods, probably aren't changing it too much. Um, uh, but what you're telling your microbiome to, to use as fuel is changing it, right? So if you, 
if you eat more fiber, then your gut microbiome Uh, those uh, molecules for fuel, and that's going to change what your microbiome becomes because you're feeding different microbes and they're going to grow more. And if you ate a carnivore diet, then, I mean, you can burn uh, different uh, proteins and things from that, or like your your microbiome can use those proteins. And there's just as much diversity going to that way after you get that shift, you know, after you go into that diet and give your microbiome time to make that shift. Um, but this idea that your microbiome needs fiber doesn't hold water um, because it can burn different amino acids and things um, too. Uh, and so it's just as much diversity if you're eating a carnivore diet versus a plant-based diet with more fiber. It's just, it's a different type of diversity because you're feeding the microbiome differently. Um, and so, but it is about creating diversity. And the problem that usually comes to in this days, uh, in this world today is that there are substances that kill off that diversity. So whether it's chronic use of antibiotics or um, things like glyphosate exposure. So if you're consuming a lot of glyphosate, um, then that's going to destroy um, bacteria in the gut. And that allows certain bacteria to proliferate too much. And then you get this monoculture in there um, or a select few different species that have overrun everything. And that's when we get like dysbiosis and stuff like that. So that's caused from like these external modern day exposures. Um, and so there's that kind of issue. But then the other aspect to gut health, because Gut health is not just um, how diverse your microbiome is. It's how how um, uh, inflamed or not inflamed your gut lining is and how well things are are linked together. So we don't want to be doing things that create holes in the gut, which can be inflammatory foods, but also lots of different toxins and things will inflame the gut and destroy the gut lining and those tight junctions that form there. But the most important thing, again, goes back to light um, because part of that part of that melatonin that's secreted or created when you get light throughout the day and then stop light after sunset that melatonin is what triggers for um your gut lining to replenish itself which happens every few days or it's supposed to happen every few days um so the same then that happens at night when you sleep so if you don't have enough melatonin you're not only not detoxifying the body removing waste doing mitophagy and autophagy you may even have insomnia you're not sleeping well but it's also not allowing the gut lining to replenish itself and repair itself like it like it usually should. Um, and I actually haven't looked into this, but I just thought of this just now. Like if the endothelial lining of the gut repairs itself every few days, I'm betting the vascular system does something similar. Um, and light probably triggers for that as well. Um, so that's how important this light is. And it just goes to show that like even like since 1970, chronic disease has risen dramatically. And that's when we introduced this really bright processed blue light that's disrupting things circadianly. Um, and that allows us to um, be indoors more too. We have this light inside, we can be inside. Um, so we're divorced from the natural sunlight and the grounding and things like that. So it's all kind of comes together and makes more sense. Um, we think about it this way. Yeah. I think, you know, also, I think they say it's the fifties when our shoes started to really change from sort of being a conductible material to a non-conductible material. So the, your whole kind of concept around grounding and earthing, there was quite a few things that happened in quite a short time period. Mm. That probably has kind of led to an accumulatory effect. And now we have these epidemics of disease. Um, but it's so interesting what you say, said there around, you know, with Tim Spector going away and sure dietary changes were going to be part of it. But I think something that doesn't get enough sort of, consideration is is what you've mentioned which is you know we're, our gut microbiome partly is a representation of the microbiome that we are within um so you know how much nature we immerse by how much human contact animal contact dung contact are we mm -hmm. having um and i just wonder how much is influenced by that when we're looking at some of these studies and saying look has to try and have this golden picture of microbiome diversity and they're eating this much fiber but Often those studies don't talk about all the other things like the grounding, the lights, and just their overall contact with their environment. Um, so it is interesting. And I guess the we've got that level of research around photobiomodulation or red light therapy and using that sort of technology and the impact it has on the microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is fascinating. It kind of all demonstrates the importance of kind of returning to that slightly more natural connected with our earth and with nature as a way to really drive health um yeah well, your body's just picking up signals from yeah. the earth right that's right. like you're 
your physiology is just interpreting its environment and then reacting accordingly. So if it gets confused because you eat a food from across the world that's got a different light stored in it that has a different potentially microbiome with it than the environment that you're in, then your body's very confused with that. Um, you know, if you're in a season um, where you're getting a certain light environment when you're outside and you come in and you totally disrupt that season with artificial light, your body gets very confused. It doesn't know what to do. Um, and so, and it's not that like, you know, cause it, it makes sense. I should say like evolutionarily, like humans until very recently were outside, you know, or very tied to the earth. Even if they did have indoor dwellings, you know, where they slept and stuff for protection, like they were outside most of the time, very tied to, to the elements of the earth. And so as much as we can in our modern day environments, we need to recreate that. I'm not saying that everybody has to go live in the woods or go camping hundred percent of the time, but you know, as much as we can, we need to reconnect with those things that give your body the right signals. That's the most important thing is give your body the right signals. Yeah. It's kind of a bit embarrassing when you put it like that, though. <laughs> it's just yeah. there's a degree of simplicity uh, that we're kind of, I think, missing uh, sometimes. Mm. <laughs> we try and overthink things a little bit. I think that humans have these large brains and sometimes uh, they get in our way. Yes, definitely. I guess, you know, one one question for you then, just to kind of finish off, because it's a question that I've had at the back of my mind for a while, just, you know, following you and people like you that share a lot of this content, um, with this idea of, you know, food being, I think I've heard uh, a friend kind of talk about it as like a, a light blueprint kind of thing, or a, a barcode, um, and it's informing us of where we are in the world and what time of year it should be how how much of that is a factor you know eating out of season food compared to maybe some of the other things we've talked about today is, is it something that we should be prioritizing is it kind of one of the first things you would consider doing or where's it fit um you know I, I, it depends on where the person is in their journey right so if they're just trying to get started i'm trying to make you know the easiest changes first like which for me is like stop eating close to bedtime and wear boo blocking glasses after the sun sets. Like that's, those are some pretty low hanging fruit there right. um, that you could do and, and have dramatic changes, you know? Um, but if someone's well into their journey and they're still having some symptoms, like especially like certain gut symptoms or metabolic symptoms or um, um, signs of like low charge or low mitochondrial function, it's like, okay, well let's look at maybe you're just slightly genetically susceptible to those things. And maybe yes, eating in season is going to make the biggest difference for you, you know? Um, and I think, you know, ideally if everybody could, they should. Um, but you know, for some people it's more realistic than others. Um, but yeah, so just to give people an idea, I'll try and put it briefly. Um, like your mitochondria have this thing called an electron transport chain. And what that does is it transports electrons that you get from your environment, like from the sun and from grounding, and you can harvest electrons from food. And it passes the electrons down this little chain, like it, they cause them tunneling, they just kind of hop along, right? And that hopping along is what literally creates energy um, for us. It creates structured water, creates reaction of oxygen species, it creates um, um, molecules of hydrogen, and ultimately at the end, ATP. Um, and so those, those little proteins that the electrons jump along, um, they are spaced in a certain way so that the electrons can make it, right? And in the winter, when we adapt to temperature, uh, colder temperatures, if you live in an area that is, gets colder in the winter, um, then those mitochondria, those, those proteins become a little bit more spaced out. And they do that because, like evolutionarily, they do that because now the electrons, lots of them still make it, but some of them don't because it's too far spaced, right? And when they don't make it, they get lost. And when they get lost, they actually release energy in the form of heat. So it makes us warmer in the winter, right? Now, the reason that's important is because if we are like in the winter, the only foods that would have been around were animal foods. So fat would have been the only thing we're burning, which is a very efficient fuel source. We can take one molecule of fat and make way more energy from it than a molecule of glucose. So that means we're we're using less electrons passed down the electron transport chain um, to make the same amount of energy as we would if we had to pass a lot of electrons down using glucose, right? And so if we're eating these foods that are not available in winter, like out of season foods, processed carbohydrates, fruit, things like that, depending on where you live, um, then 
we're passing more electrons down, right? That chain that's not designed to pass that or to keep that many more electrons. And so we start losing electrons and we create a lot of heat, but we also lose a lot of energy. That energy doesn't get, it gets lost by the mitochondria, but doesn't get lost by the body. The body stores it. So that's creating metabolic dysfunction, right? Yeah. Which is why we see metabolic diseases get worse in the winter. Not because it's cold, but because we're adapting to cold and also trying to eat summer foods. Right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's incredibly interesting how tied we are to light and temperature. And so that's the other thing too, is that the electrons in and photons and protons that are in a plant where it grows are imprinted with the energy or the light energy that that plant grew in. So if that plant was grown in Mexico and you're in Maine or the UK, you know, like that's a totally different light environment. And so then your body's using that, that energy and that energy gets broken down in your gut by your microbiome and the gut bacteria don't have DHA. So they don't use light very well, um, which is why they can live in the gut. Um, but they, that light gets released and the, and the gut bacteria don't use it, but your, the lining of the gut uses it. And that's a different light environment than your gut is getting circadianly from your, your external environment. And that creates confusion. It's the same thing in the mitochondria. If you're using those electrons and a different light information, it's called infradian rhythm. Uh, is a different light information is being communicated down the electron transport chain from those from that energy that was stored in the plant in Mexico, and you're in the UK, then that creates this um, this confusing signal to the micro or to the mitochondria, which can damage them um, and result in more released energy, which is not again uh, it's lost by the mitochondria, but not lost by the body, and then it's stored. Um, and so that creates metabolic dysfunction. Like it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, that is amazing. And, you know, I just, the things that come to mind around that is you, we're doing a good thing for the planet as well, just by moving to local seasonal produce. Yeah. I'm kind of really interested in the whole mycotoxin component from a dietary perspective as well, because of, as you mentioned earlier, kind of our global economy, a lot of our foods moldy and um, mm kind of bypass mm. that concern as well so there's kind of all sorts of reasons why it would be a good thing for all of us to start focusing more around for sure yeah i mean like if you look at you know everybody talks about incorrectly cows are driving you know the the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and stuff or co2 emissions and uh if you look at it there's data from the fao and things that cows are like two percent of the um co2 emissions um and transportation is like 33%. Wow. So it's like, if we wanted to mo a most bang for our buck thing, it wouldn't be the cows, which makes no sense evolutionarily anyways. Um, but it would be stop supporting industry that transports things like food across the world so that you can have your avocado in January in the that doesn't make sense like and if we if we stop transporting these things and focus on more local stuff we're going to have a bigger impact on the amount of emissions because we're we're telling industry hey we don't want things to be shipped ever we don't need it to be you know we have what we need here locally you know so um and support your local like um local farmers but also your local businesses and things like that yeah amazing Dr. Hussey, thank you so much for sparing the time to come and chat with me today. I'm really looking forward to sharing this with everyone. I think we're going to get some, some good feedback. Um, I've definitely learned a few new things listening to you. Um, I'll mention your book in the intro as well, which I highly recommend if people want to dive into this more and learn about your story. Um, is there anything you want to just conclude with? Anything you want to sort of emphasize? Anything we haven't sort of mentioned that you think is important? Uh one way I kind of like to something up sometimes is, is like, cause lots of this information can get confusing. It's like, people are like, well, how do I, what do I know what to do? There's just, I don't even know. And they just kind of quit. Um, and I think that one way to organize it in your brain that makes more sense to me at least is ultimately we have all these hyper realities in front of our face, things that we take as more real than what's actually real. Um, like some, some medical testing could be an example. Um, but you know, ultimately, life has made it this far because of the real stimuli that it has from its environment. Um, life has made it this far, and humans 
technically you could consider one of the most successful species on earth. Um, and, and we've made it this far, not by overanalyzing our biochemistry or, or, um, over testing certain markers in our, our today, right? So what got us where we are today is the stimulus from the natural environment, the real things. So when I tell people like focus on what's real, um, like what's real food, what's real light, what is real connection with the earth and with other human beings, real relationships, um, like those are the things that drive humanity and life in general. So just like when you're asking yourself, is this something I should do? Like, is it real? Should I maintain a relationship with this person? Is it a real authentic relationship or are they using you for something, you know, or is it things like that? You know, is this, so I eat this food. Well, could you pick this off a plant or, you know, go hunt this down in the forest and ultimately it's more whole than, than a processed food that never occurs in nature. Like use that kind of context to dictate what you allow into or don't allow into your life. Perfect. I like it. I think that's it. People need sort of actionable basic convenience things to do and that's a nice way of framing it yeah uh, dr hussey thank you very much uh, i look forward to, to following your journey onwards from here thank you